What's for breakfast? Bagel, Bagel cream cheese. I heard you on uh, Sports Talk Radio last week. Sports Is that you? Did you call in? <laughs> Talking about U of A basketball. No. No? Was it another Mary Murphy? Yeah. Sounded There's Mary like Murphy's you. all over the place. And we sound alike? Sounded just like you. Oh, wow. What did I say? I <laughs> how you like the new U of A reference, Sammy Johnson. Oh, oh, no, no, it wasn't oh me. God, it sounded just like you. I would have bet money. No kidding. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't usually weigh in on um, this because I'm from I'm from Illinois. I'm Big Ten. That's Big crazy. Ten. Yeah. It's wow. Well, oh, there's Mary you. Murphy's all over the place. We are all over the place. That's true. Time. Did you guys get my message yesterday about all the distributors? The guy that speaks to the door center. Door center. I don't understand. He wanted to come through the storm to the office. He was storming. It was loud and obnoxious. Could he have made an appointment to come quietly? Yeah. He could have. He was demanding. I was impressed. 
Christ. Closer. <laughs> Shortcut. Supervisor Elias. Let me make up one up. 
moment of personal privilege before we go on. Okay. You know, I, we have a big crowd here today, and uh, I just wanted to note that uh, some of these cameras in the room are not operated by uh, Pima County government, per se, but by a specific supervisory office. Um, they are typically left on during the breaks, so uh, you might want to be careful with your private conversations because uh, sometimes people's private conversations have ended up on YouTube for the world to see. And so uh, with that in mind, I would just caution everybody to uh, please stay away from those cameras and, and be careful about uh, private comments that you might want to make. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, and now please rise for the invocation to be offered by Reverend Sharon Raglan of St. Mark's United Methodist Church and the Pledge of Allegiance to follow to be led by Supervisor Elise. Good morning. Let's pray. We thank you, O oh God, for spring in the desert, for cool morning breezes and the bursting forth of wildflowers and blooming cacti, for the awakening of lizards and the running of rabbits and quail, we thank you for the lengthening of days, which reminds us of the constant cycle of life for which you have charge. We are grateful for the people you give us to love and serve, and who by some miracle also care about us. Most of all today, O oh God, we thank you for the privilege of serving you as elected and appointed and interested people. As we seek to be faithful to you and to all people, give us your guidance and your wisdom your commitment to justice and fairness for all people, your everlasting gift of hope, sometimes in the midst of suffering and hardship. Help us to be wise with resources, compassionate with people, and ever guided by your love. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now we will pause for pause. Officer Bowden, who you have read, who is read? Tell us about Red. Thank you. Oh, Madam Chair. Supervisor Elias. I was going to say that Red seems like a horse dog, but um, as I think about it, I think it's an auto racing dog. Uh, so uh, anybody who can uh, help us find a home for Red, you know, talk to your friends. I understand a lot of people who might be here can't take another dog, but talk to your friends and see if they need a pad. Talk to your uh, fellow uh, folks who go to church with you on Sunday and, and see if they need a dog. And, and um, you know, 
we have a lot of nice animals over there at Animal Care, so we certainly appreciate anybody who would come by, and, and um, we would appreciate that anybody uh, being good to those animals and good to the folks who work over there at Animal Care. As you can see, they're all nice people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have, I don't think Brad wants to leave. <laughs> I do. Um, we do have one change to the agenda on the consent calendar, page six, item 12, proclamation. We're going to remove the item from the consent calendar and present it on the regular agenda. Uh, if there are no objections, we'll proceed then with that. And now I'm going to move uh, one item on the uh, addendum agenda. Uh, first, we are honored today that is addendum item number one. It's a presentation by the Me Mexican Consulate of Tucson. We are pleased today to have with us Ricardo Pina Alberon, Consul of Mexico. He's going to address us regarding the services offered to Pima County residents by the Mexican Consulate Office in Tucson, if you want to come forward. I know you have a great presentation for us. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Pima County Board of Supervisors. Supervisor Chairman Chair, 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 Ray Carroll, Richard Diaz, and uh, Chuck Hunter is administrator of the Pima County as the Board of Supervisors. It is my great, great honor to appear before you. Oh, well, uh, we need, okay, what is the direction? You're, we need the, no, no, we're fine now. Okay. We're okay, yeah, we're fine. Yeah, yeah we're good. I'm yes, sorry for interrupting I was getting directions from you know, our director back then. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity and for this amazing crowd. Uh, I understand that it's the first time ever against the consul of before Pima County. For the supervisor, so it's a great, great honor to be here. You must know that the Mexican consulate is here to serve him in Pinal County, or because of the Tucson city that we are based here. Uh, uh, we have been over here for more than 70 years. So it's a very historic consulate uh, being here to serve the community as a whole, of course, the boys in Mexican community. We do prepare some slides for you, and you have a hint in your table. Uh, because I really would like to talk about the role of Mexico, the importance of Mexico, the U U.S. and Mexico trade, uh, some talks about uh, some about immigration, but the most important, how about the Arizona and Mexico related, and as you stated at the very beginning, about the services that the Mexican consulate is uh, providing to, to the community as a whole. Just to start, we put, uh, you're going to see in the slide, what is the role of Mexico in the international arena right now? It's the size of Mexico, which is uh, uh, very new. We are the 14 in terms of territory, the 11 in terms of population, the 14 in terms of uh, GDP production, the 13 as a top trader of goods. Uh, Mexico is ranked as the best country to start a business in Latin America and the 35th in the world. Uh, Mexico City itself, it's the fifth largest city in terms of population. But why Mexico now? This is probably the question that is uh, around every, every uh, business people, every uh, magazine, uh, in, in what we, they uh, have uh, called now the Mexico's momentum. What is different among Mexico? And what is different? Well, Mexico uh, is different because of NAFTA, uh, because we have signed more than 10 other different trade agreements with the U.S., with Japan, with Japan, with Israel, with Latin American countries, which uh, totalize uh, 42 countries in the world, uh, which uh, with this uh, network of trade agreements, we can reach uh, 1 billion consumers. Mexico right now is considered as a relevant platform to reduce, to produce and to export to other countries. And we already have ongoing negotiations with the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, so far, right now, and for the establishment of a free trade zone as part of the Pacific Atlantic, it's going to give, all, give, all Mex give Mexico more leverage in terms of trade and economic uh, uh, development. This is, a, this is a figure and a map about Mexico uh, that tries to portray Mexico as a whole. 
as an import and export country and it provides the same uh, numbers that was they referred before. Uh, you must know that Mexico has engaged with the last uh, new administration, President Peña Nieto, and that you had engaged with uh, uh, in a big uh, uh, structural change. So starting uh, in 2013, President Peña Nieto signed a pact with the different and political forces in Mexico in order to gain and reach major reforms. So 2013 was a highly success in our administration because we reached the agreement with every party around in order to uh, uh, have a political, and energy, and financial, fiscal, and educational, and telecom and economic competence reform. This is happening right now. And 2014 is very dedicated to produce the bylaws. So 2014 is going to be a highly legislative time in Mexico in order to produce this change. Mexico is trying to set itself to continue its role, to continue working for a new uh, uh, leverage, for a new relationship uh, for the world. But what about the US and Mexico relationship? For well, the most significant the most significant aspect of our relationship is the border itself. <laughs> and at the border, we have just in 2,000 mile border uh, in between Mexico and the U.S., 25 U.S. Uh, counties and 39 Mexican municipalities that encompass together uh, around 13 million inhabitants uh, sharing on an everyday basis at our border. So we do uh, listen uh, a lot of uh, or get a lot of information in regard to what's going on at the border. But let me tell you, we have at the border also a highly success stories in between our everyday exchange. We have human exchange, educational exchange. We have a, a region that encompass, as I said before, 13 million inhabitants. But it is said that the region itself is 30 million uh, 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 economy in between uh, Mexico and the U.S. So immigration and security issues are important areas of collaboration, but also economic operations that takes to NAFTA and other areas such as environment, like the border political program, political, the border needs or mechanisms that we already have in place, and cultural insight. Just on May 2013, during a recent encounter in between President Peña Nieto and President Obama, the two of our presidents just signed three different acts. But totally designed to put us in the right path for a new uh, trade exchange. One of them is the, the so-called DEAN, High Level Economic Level, that seeks to forge a more competitive and dynamic trade relationship between Mexico and the United States. The other one is the FOBESI, it's a bilateral program on higher education, innovation, and research. This is in addition to seeking 21st century labor force which will allow the region to become prosperous. The mission of the bilateral forum, the FOBESI, is to foster, foster the mutual understanding between both countries through programs addressing student and mobility, academic change, research, and innovation in areas of shared interest and to contribute to the competitiveness and economic development of the region. You must know that one of the basic goals in between US and Mexico so far, right now, from here to 2018, is to put, is to put a, a 50,000, for the, for the study of the US, 50,000 US students in Mexican universities. In our case, 100,000 Mexican students in US universities. So far, right now, we have 14,000 uh, students in US universities, students different degrees, including PhDs and master's. Just here in Arizona University, with which we have a great relationship, we have 140 PhD and master degree students. So we can uh, uh, tell that we have a great relationship with Arizona University, which uh, uh, fosters a relationship in every sense of the world with uh, not only the country, the city, and else. The last uh, uh, instrument that was signed at our president uh, last May was the Museum. Mexico-U.S. Entrepreneurship and Innovation Council. The goal is 
to foster and to support a medium sized and small enterprise to continue producing and exchanging on a very international level. What about the US and Mexico trade? Well, let me just provide some specific facts about our relationship. Mexico already buys more US products than any other nation, except uh, with the exception of Canada. Mexico and the United States are partners in manufacturing. US investment in Mexico has grown nearly six folds since NAFTA was put into place. Mexican companies have increased the, their uh, foreign direct investment in the US, passing from $1.2 billion in 1992 to $12.6 billion in 2010. So Mexico is an investor in the US also. Of course, US is the main investor uh, uh, of the world in Mexico encompassing more than 70, not more than 60 billion dollars since 1990. These are part of the facts also in between the Mexico and the US relationship. Production sharing, uh, we have a very bilateral collaboration. And this is very important. A full 40% of the content in US imports from Mexico is actually produced in the US. In other words, 40 cents of every dollar spent on imports from Mexico come back to the US the quantity 10 times greater than the full cent return for each dollar based on Chinese imports. This is just to put us in perspective of the relationship and the importance of the exchange. This specific figure was, tells you about uh, agricultural trade between Mexico and the US. And you can see that the Nivales and Son area, we have a big, uh, big share, almost $3 billion dollars which is more than 35% of the total agricultural trade between Mexico and the U.S. <clears throat> more facts. Mexico is the top export destination for five states. For California, for Arizona, for New Mexico, for Texas, and for New Hampshire. The U.S.-Mexico's main trade partner in Mexico is the third trade partner of the U.S. for total trade. There are, and I, uh, we provide a, a map which is in your field. We, we, there are 6 million US jobs so far, right now, that depend on trade in Mexico. Two border states that trade extensively with Mexico, which is California, 692,000 jobs. And Texas, 463,000 jobs have from those. Or Arizona has uh, a share of 100,000 jobs depending on trade in Mexico, just in Arizona as a whole. What about immigration in between Mexico and the US? Well, immigration is a very historical and complex phenomenon, and I want to stay pretty much on that. We want to say that there are approximately 33.7 million people of Mexican origin living in the US. 10 million of them were born in Mexico. And according to the US Department of State, over a million US citizens uh, are currently living in Mexico as students, retreat, or businessmen. It's the size of the U.S. population living in Mexico. What about Arizona and, and Mexico relations? Well, Mexico is the main, the main trade partner of Arizona. With about 20 million <coughs> visitors born and crossed annually uh, in between Mexico and Arizona, this zone stands as one of the most active, active borders in the world. Mexican visitors spend approximately 7.3 million each day in Arizona, providing an annual impact in trade and economics of 2.3 billion dollars a year. About 13 million dollars in merchandise are exchanged between the Grand Canyon state of Mexico, exceeds the trade between Mexico and Central America as a whole on a yearly basis. During the last years, Mexico exported about 6 million dollars in merchandise and received 34% of Arizona exports, which means $6.2 million billion dollars uh, in computers and electronics as the main use. More facts. $15 billion in goods headed to other states close to Arizona consequently on a yearly basis. Regarding labor opportunities, as I said before, more than 100,000 jobs are directly related to trade with Mexico. Jobs in Arizona. These are was a quarterly of the uh, very important Mexican companies that now uh, work, perform, lead, produce, <coughs> and share in Tucson. Asalto, Grupo Mexico, Siemens, the offshore group, Arizona Canyon Company, La Costeña, 
in supermarket. In this uh, general scope, what about the next proposal? Well, the next proposal was established, as I said at the very beginning, more than 70,000 years ago. Uh, this concept in particular uh, encompassed, as a jurisdiction, uh, services to around 384,000 people, which is the Mexican population in uh, the total Pima and Pinal counties. Uh, the relationship in between Arizona and Mexico is so important, uh, so intensive, that we have five different consulates in Arizona. We have one in Phoenix, we have uh, also in Tucson, and three convex consulates at the borderline, Yuma, Nogales, uh, Yuma, Nogales, and Douglas. Those are five different consulates to provide services to the general population. Yes, we represent the Mexican government, but we provide a number of services to the American community as a whole. <clears throat> this is just the population, and the share of the Mexican population is the main cities in Pina and Pinal, which is Tucson and Casa Grande. <clears throat> and this is, we wanted to present to you, the consular network, Mexican consular network in the US. There is no any other more important consular network from one country into another country in the world. And this is because the size of the Mexican population and the requirements that they have to the Mexican federal government being here, living here, producing here in the US. So we do have 50 consulates in the US, uh, 10 in just 10 in uh, Texas, 9 in California, and 11 along the borderline. We don't have uh, one consulate, one specific consulate in each one of the states because that depends on the general population, the concentration of the Mexican population. That is why in my uh, former course, I was serving four different states, the Boise Island. But here in Tucson, uh, as far as the communities that concentrated, we just serve Pima and Pinal counties, and we left the rest of the jurisdiction to different consulates working with the different communities in Arizona. The Mexican Council is really committed to protect and assist the Mexican community living in Lima and Pinar. We also, we also promote uh, a cultural population in order to enhance, enhance the relationship between Mexico and Atrusha. These are uh, our services here to the Mexican community, which include the issue of official Mexican documents, Mexican uh, legal documents, Assistant, uh, assistance in emergencies, providing accurate information about the current migration debates in order to prevent fraud or abuse, uh, provide <coughs> good rate registry for people born outside of Mexico, as far as Mexican citizens, promotion of even health education and social programs that benefit Mexican migrants and their families in Mexico. The consular representation also seeks to reach out to the community as a whole through the issues of work, study, or resident visas for non-Mexican citizens, or for strengthening the political relationship with local, state, and federal authorities, as well as promoting trade and investment with Mexico. We are also engaged, pretty uh, uh, committed, in fostering cultural exchange. So we do participate in different venues at the Tucson Festival of Food for the first time ever we open the Latin American Pavilion, in which we performance uh, performance from Mexico, at the Mexican Film Festival in Tucson City, Mexico, arts exhibitions, film screenings, and community and city events. This is my presentation. I want to finish. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone of you, for your time. And I, of course, I'm more than open to any specific question of you. I want to pose. Thank you uh, to the World Super Rosa Thank you, Council. Any um Questions or comments on Supervisor Luis? I just wanted to, to uh, thank uh, Senor Pineda for coming here today and offering this presentation. I think it's important to examine um, um, how closely our economies are intertwined with each other and is really the nature of uh, the very beginnings of all our relationships with Mexico. And it's an important thing for all of us to remember um, the academic um, connections that we all have uh, through our universities and through our youth and through our families and how they grow and, 
and find um, intellectual curiosity and answers um, at those institutions. So I certainly appreciate that as well. Pima County intends to continue cooperating with the Bozo de Mexico. We've always had an excellent relationship and we appreciate that. As the United States County with the longest expanse of border with Mexico, it is extremely important to us that we cooperate with you uh, on public safety issues as well as emergencies and, and situations where people become vulnerable and, and that's very important to us. And, and in particular, you know, I, I send greetings from the, the Elias family to you as well as Sima Villera for coming here today. Our family has been here for, for many generations and in fact we, we came to the Pimeria Alta uh, before it became a part of Mexico, but we're very uh, we're very close to our family in Mexico. We respect the relationship that we have. So I bring you their greetings as well. And, and thank you for coming here today. Thank you, Supervisor Thank you, thank you Supervisor Liz. Madam Chair, um, Supervisor, uh, actually, uh, Supervisor Valadez is next. Then we could just supervise now. Senor Consul, I, I want to thank you uh, uh, for being here and, and for a very informative uh, presentation that you gave today. I, I was actually very impressed with uh, with some of the things that you presented and, and I think a lot of facts. Uh, we, we often hear a lot of conjecture um, and it is uh, very uh, very useful to us to have the kind of information you provided here today that's based on facts and history and data and science. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. Thank you also for, for coming before us. Um, I, I know you've been working with, uh, with uh, Ms. Bravo and I'm sure she's talked to you about the importance that we as Pima County, as Richard said, have placed in the relationship that we have with Sonora and with Mexico. Uh, and that uh, not only do we recognize as Arizona's largest trading partner, but it's, it's family. Um, we, have, uh, we have gone so far as to uh, a very large portion of our economic development plan. It's a written document for Pima County in, incorporates the importance of Mexico and Sonora, and, uh, and that will continue, and I certainly hope that that, uh, that certainly grow, and that uh, the efforts that Mexico and Sonora are making will bear more, even more. So thank you. thank you. Supervisor Miller. Mr. Tineda, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very informative. Um, one question I had is you had the four trade, highest trading partners of the four states, and one of them was New Hampshire. And I was curious about the products and the trade between the state of New Hampshire because so far away from the border. And I was curious that other states closer to the border are as involved in trading with Mexico. Yes, of course. Electronics and computer. Electronics and computer. Maple yeah. okay. syrup. Yeah. Electronics and computer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, mainly. Thank you. It's very interesting. Thank you very much. Supervisor Carroll. Mr. Council, uh, Pineda, I'm delighted. I'm glad that you came. I hope you are feeling as welcome as I was when I visited your council offices last month. Appreciate Sebastian and the rest of your staff preparing that report. And I'm glad you could give us a hard copy because I think it is important for us to share it through our offices with others that may be interested in expanding their trade or finding a new way to uh, increase their business sales by trading more with Mexico. So I look forward to the relationship. Thank you again for being here. I know you've been in town for a year, but it's fabulous that you would uh, be the first council to visit our chamber, and we hope you felt very welcome here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I just want to add, I think what really struck me uh, during your presentation and uh, as you advanced it, was the fact that we are one economic region and that border needs to be seamless. So I appreciate the efforts that you are uh, taking to make that happen. And I know we've been in dialogue with you trying to deal with um, moving uh, uh, goods and services through Mariposa. And uh, we want to we want to continue to see if we can't uh, uh, make that more, it's, it's hardly seamless now. We need, to, we need to bring some seamlessness to that process. And again, thanks so much for taking time out of your schedule to inform us. And with that, I'm with Supervisor Elias, uh, Vice Chair, we, we'd like to present you with some.
Before we move on to the next item, I just had a question. Um, the council gave us some information. We have hard copies. I'm wondering, and I noticed that there's a PowerPoint presentation, if there is some way we could get a link on our website to that presentation so others can view it. That's a very good idea. Thank you. now um, on the uh, regular agenda we have item five, five um, presentation of a proclamation regarding youth HIV AIDS awareness day what's pleasure the board Met motion in a second or the no objections hearing none motion carries supervisor Elias would you do the honors and um, I think we have Jay Smith, Lene Lindsay, and Aaron Butler of Southern Arizona AIDS Foundation here to receive the proclamation. Um, whereas Advocates for Youth in 2013 created Youth HIV AIDS Awareness Day to be observed annually on the 10th day of April, and whereas on April 10, 2013, Tucson and Pima County joined in a national event dedicated to celebrating the hard work young people are doing across the country to fight the HIV AIDS epidemic, educating the public about the impact of HIV AIDS on young people and honoring the lives of those we have lost in the struggle. And whereas Youth HIV AIDS Awareness Day is an opportunity for people nationwide to unite in the fight to create an AIDS-free generation, to start an open dialogue about stigmas of being young and impacted by AIDS <laughs> HIV, and to educate others on how HIV issues affect young people across the nation. And whereas every month, 1,000 young people are infected with HIV, and over 76,400 young people across the country currently are living with HIV. And whereas a coalition of local agency sponsors, our Tucson event includes Southern Arizona AIDS Foundation, Arizona Life Links for Youth, Reaching Adolescence Prevention Project, I'm almost hard to say, Life Plus Project, HIV Youth Peer Education, Voss and Maker House. Now therefore be it resolved that the Pima County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaims Thursday, April 10, 2014 to be Youth HIV AIDS Awareness Day and encourages all Pima County residents ages 12 to 24 to participate with their friends and families in a community event on Thursday, April 10 from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Maker House in downtown Tucson at 283 North Stone, and to get involved in this opportunity to show support for young people in our community and to fight for an AIDS-free generation. Passed and adopted this 8th day of April, 2014. And uh, I'd just like to say thanks to these uh, young people for their work and their continued efforts to bring about an AIDS-free generation. Uh, it's important for all of us. It's a very critical public health issue that we all have to be concerned with. And um, really understanding how horrible the stigma is attached to people living with HIV and how difficult it makes their lives should make us all stand up and realize that we are each other's neighbors and that we should treat each other like we would like to be treated. But that doesn't always work out. 
and in memory of those people who have uh, lost their lives in that struggle against AIDS and HIV, I'd ask everybody to stand for a moment so we have a moment of silence. If you want to stand. Please stand. And then we'll hear from these young people very briefly. Thank you. Please be seated. First off, I would like to thank the Board of Supervisors for acknowledging um, this day um, because it's very important for us to educate and inform the youth about the stigmas around HIV and AIDS because one out of four uh, young adults under 24 are infected with uh, AIDS and that's new cases. Um, and I would like to once again um, invite youth uh, 12 to 13 to come down to our event at Maker House um, with their trusted support or their trusted adult or guardian. Thank you so much. Thank you, Supervisor Elias. Uh, now I want to move to the um, Consent calendar item 12, we pulled that item. Uh, it is proclaiming the week of May 1st through the 7th to be Youth Week in Pima County. What's pleasure the board on this item? Move the item. Motion and a second to approve if there are no objections. Motion carries. And Supervisor Valadez, will you uh, present this? I think Peggy Nelson is here, who is a chairperson of Youth Activities for Elks Lodge to receive the proclamation. through May 7, 2014 as Elks National Youth uh, Week to honor our country's uh, youth, uh, younger citizens for their accomplishments and to give fitting recognition of their services to the community, state, nation. And whereas Kelly the Mountain Elks number, Lodge number 2815 will sponsor an observance during that week in tribute to the youth citizens of this community, and whereas no event could be more deserving of our support and participation than one such as this, dedicated to these young people who represent the nation's greatest resources and who in the years ahead will assume the responsibility for advancement of our free society. And whereas our youth need guidance, inspiration, and encouragement that we alone can give to help develop those qualities a ca uh, character essential for future leadership needed to serve our nation, and whereas, to achieve this worthy objective, we should demonstrate our partnership with uh, youth, our understanding of their hopes and aspirations, and our sincere willingness to help prepare them in every way for the responsibilities and opportunities of citizenship. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pima County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaims the week of May 1st, 2014, through May 7, 2014, to be Youth Week in Pima County, and urges all departments of government, all civic, fraternal, and patriotic groups, and citizens generally to participate wholeheartedly in its observance. Passed and adopted this eighth day of April, 2014. <coughs> Carolina Mountain Elks, of course, is just one lodge uh, out of thousands throughout the country. We have several programs that we do with the children, um, starting with Americanism essay, drug and awareness poster and essay competitions, our hoop shoe competition, soccer competition, student of the year, student of the month, which goes into student of the year. Uh, we do a lot with Special Olympics. We have a major event coming up on April 26th that's open to the public. It's our parking lot event to raise money for Special Olympics. And if the public is welcome. We're on North Oracle Road up in Catalina. And 
I'm very proud of our lodge and of the benevolent and protective order of elves of the United States because of their commitment both to our children who will be our future tomorrow and also for our community service that we do in our community of Catalina. Thank you. And thank you, Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the elves for all the work you're doing. Thank you. And now we're moving on to the addendum agenda item three, presentation of the proclamation to Mark Reynolds, Elliot Lax, oh, yeah, Elliot Lax, Ana Robles de Monge, and Mera Reynosa, um, proclaiming April 11th through the 13th to be Global Youth Services Day. What's the pleasure of the board on this item? I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second if there are no objections. Motion carries and Supervisor Carroll will do the presentation. This is working. This is for you all. There's your proclamation. Whereas Global Youth Services Day is a time for everyone to celebrate the contributions of young people that they make to their communities every day of the year through service and service learning. And whereas Global Youth Services Day, a program of Youth Service America, is one of the largest service events in the world and is dedicated solely to engineering. Let me, let me switch it off. You can have that. I'm taking the cue from my clerk there. Let's see if I can find that. That's, that's a challenge. In 2014, Global Youth Services Day is being observed for the 26th year in all 50 states and for the 15th year globally in more than 100 countries on six continents. And whereas Pima County depends on youth as assets vital to its communities and benefits from their knowledge, idealism, skills, perspectives, ideas, and creativity, as the youth lead activities involving awareness, service, advocacy, and philanthropy. And whereas nearly one third of the US population, about 104 million residents, and nearly one half of the global population is under 25 years old. And whereas the Edward M. Kennedy Service America Act recognizes Global Youth Service Day as a national day of service and calls on U.S. citizens to participate. And whereas Youth Service America and the Tucson Service Learning Group are mobilizing the residents of Pima County to serve their communities on Global Youth Services Days. And whereas high quality community service and service learning programs increase young people's academic engagement, achievement, improve their workforce readiness and 21st century skills, refine their social, emotional, and behavioral skills, and enhance their civic knowledge and engagement, young people improve their communities and global services days by addressing a myriad of critical issues such as literacy, dropping out of high school, childhood obesity, hunger, poverty, environmental degradation, public safety, and disaster preparedness. And whereas Global Youth Services Days provides an opportunity for schools, community, and faith-based organizations, government agencies, businesses, and families to engage youth as active citizens, community leaders, and problem solvers. Now, be it resolved, <laughs> thought we'd never get there to you. <laughs> that the Pima County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaims April 11th through the 13th to be Global Youth Services Day in Pima County and urges all residents to make service their community, in their communities a high priority and a regular practice passed and adopted this 8th day of April 2014 by Sharon Bronson, the Chair of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. You got to stand up for two proclamations today. Good for you. Nice to see you, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to hear from you, the young people. Would you like to say a few words? <laughs> would you like to say a few words? You, you look good. Hold on. Make sure they get uh, their spokesperson here on the way. On behalf of the uh, Tucson Service Learning Group, I'd like to thank the board, um, and especially Richard Elias' office, and um, Mr. Keith Bagwell, who I think snuck out, uh, for uh, ran us through their office, and we really appreciate the support. Um, and uh, thank you to the board for recognizing the youth of Pima County and their desire and ability to serve. 
And um, as the Reverend Ragland said in her invocation this morning, we should all be thankful for the opportunity to serve. Just a quick heads up, this Friday between 4 and 7 p.m. downtown um, on Pennington Street is the annual Pennington Street Block Party, which is the signature project in our community for it. There'll be lots of youth there either doing projects at the Block Party, being recognized for things that they did earlier during the year, and the uh, Ray Davies um, Citizens Award for high school seniors will be given out at the block party as well. So if you have a chance to come Friday afternoon, 4 p.m. till 7, or any part of that, please, please do so. There's other events around town as well. If you go to the Global Youth Service Day website, gysd.org, you can look at a map of the world which shows where all the projects are globally. And if you click on Southern Arizona, you get an idea of what's happening in our community. Thanks. Thank you all for being here. Have a nice day. Congratulations. Thank you. Now move on to item two, presentation of a proclamation to Shirley Mooney of the American Association of Women, Tucson Branch, proclaiming the day of Tuesday, April 8th, to be Equal Pay Day. With pleasure, the board. Madam Chair, I'll move the item. Motion and a second to approve. Uh, there are no objection. Motion carries, and I will make the presentation not to Shirley, but to Laura Penny. Are you? Or, no, no, no. Shirley here. Oh, oh, there she is. Are you right? Okay. Come on, Laura. You should come up to her. Come on, Laura. Just a little more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Whereas, more than 50 years after Congress passed and President John F. Kennedy signed the Equal Pay Act of 1963, women, especially minority women, continue to suffer the consequences of unequal pay. And whereas, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, women working full-time in 2012 earned an average of 77% of the earnings of their male counterparts indicating that there has been very little change in this uh, in this in a century and a half, in half a century, boy, probably at least a century and a half, right? <laughs> and whereas, according to one estimate, college-educated women working full-time earn more than half a million dollars less than their male peers over a lifetime, and whereas a lifetime of lower pay means women have less income to save for retirement and less income counted for Social Security or a pension benefit formula, and whereas the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009 restored employees' rights to challenge gender pay gaps in court, but Congress needs to do more to close loopholes in the Equal Pay Act and to approve its effectiveness by passing the Paycheck Fairness Act, and whereas, since nearly four in ten mothers are primarily our primary family breadwinners, and nearly two thirds are significant earners, pay equity is critical to families' economic security. Whereas pay equity policies can be implemented easily and without undue cost in both the public and private sectors, and whereas Tuesday, April 8th, symbolizes the approximate time when the wages paid to U.S. women since January 1st, 2013, catch up with wages paid to men in calendar year 2013. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pima County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaims Tuesday, April 8th, 2014, to be Equal Pay Day and urges all Pima County residents to recognize the full value of women's skills and their significant contributions to the labor force, and further encourages local businesses to conduct internal pay evaluations to ensure their women employees are paid fairly, passed and adopted uh, this 8th day of April, 2014. Did you want to say a few words? Thank you, and we have representatives here from um, the Women's Foundation of Southern Arizona, 
the um, Women's Political Caucus and the Women and the Pima County Tucson Women's Commission are all represented here today, and we appreciate the proclamation. Appreciate all the work that um, your organization does, and, and Laura, I understand that your organization uh, just uh, had a study completed um, that talks about women and their. Um, the, the single moms working and what it takes to just, did you want to say just a couple words? Some of those st statistics are astounding. Um, the Women's Foundation completed a study that looked at what it costs a family of a given configuration to get by uh, and found that many families are spending more for child care than they are for rent. Um, and that even families that are making more than the federal poverty limit are struggling uh, to make ends meet. Uh, and so investing in women and paying them fairly um, will be a huge uh, economic driver. You can also go to aauw.org and find lots of information about not only Equal Pay Day, but the statistics on women's pay nationwide. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. As a, as a part of this item and our approval of it, I, I'd like to ask Mr. Huckleberry to see if we could work on putting together an internal pay evaluation for Pima County so we can take a look at uh, how wages are structured throughout Pima County and uh, start to deal with these issues as well for ourselves. Um, you beat me to the punch. I was just going to do that. <laughs> Didn't let Thank you get you. back, Sharon. Sorry no. about that. All right. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, th uh, thank you all, uh, all of you who uh, uh, received uh, proclamations today. We appreciate the service you uh, give to Pima County. I want to, since we're on the addendum agenda, uh, I want to move to item four, uh, mitigation impacts, Kinder Marger, Sierra Rita Pipeline. Uh, I received a call last night, and I think uh, Mr. Huckleberry did also, asking for a continuation uh, from Kinder Morgan. Mr. Huckleberry, do you have any comments specifically on this item? What is your recommendation? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, last night I received a call from the representative of Kinder Morgan and uh, requesting that the item be continued. Uh, and uh, I would suggest if we continue to continue to the first meeting in May uh, with, the, with the understanding that uh, Kinder Morgan will continue to work with uh, not only Pima County but uh, the ranchers in the Altar Valley to minimize the impacts of this particular pipeline. Uh, I think you also received uh, last night, and, and even if some of you picked it up this morning, a uh, very long and lengthy letter from Kinder Morgan, their president, and uh, it's about um, Oh, 13 pages, and I finally found someone who could write longer letters than I do. Um, but uh, it, um, you know, many of the points in the letter I think I would probably agree with if we were dealing with an alignment that was parallel to State Route 286 and largely within uh, the right of way that's already a disturbed corridor uh, in the Altar Valley. Uh, what the letter fails to understand is that we're dealing with a completely separate corridor uh, at the request of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service who are the operators of Buenos Aires. And what they've effectively done is caused uh, the pipeline alignment to be placed along its western boundary of the, of the uh, wildlife refuge. Uh, that really creates a second corridor, and therefore all of the mitigation issues that we've raised uh, in our letters and, and in our comments uh, to uh, FERC and their impact statements and their development of impact statements. Uh, so I, you know, I would you know, welcome a dialogue with the president of uh, Kendrick Morgan and uh, hopefully uh, the individual can, can be available uh, when the board considers this again if you do can continue it. Um, and and I, the only other issue that uh, I find a little concerning is the fact that in, in the letter it relies on FERC, uh, the federal agency with regard to mitigation. And some of the mitigation issues that we continue to point out are, are pretty obvious to most, and what I'd like to do is just pass out a 
a picture that was in the Arizona Daily Star uh, uh, some time ago. And what you see in this picture is the Kinder Morgan Pipeline and its uh, mitigation uh, in the Cienega Creek area. Could we get that on um, the, yeah. Yeah, we can, we can put that in the picture. It, uh, picture tells a thousand words with regard to mitigation. And this is a pipeline that was, that was uh, uh, rebuilt and enlarged in Pima County uh, seven years ago. And you see the state of the mitigation that uh, effectively there, are, there isn't any. And so that's, that's our concern with leaving uh, mitigation to a federal agency that frankly doesn't happen. I think the other thing that's most concerning now is the same federal agency, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, who said the pipeline cannot go parallel to State Route 286 and required it to go around uh, the refuge, is now saying that it's perfectly compatible for uh, the, uh, the uh, refuge to have Kinder Morgan use the crossroads of those dirt roads uh, that connect the State Route 286 and its proposed pipeline. They're talking about improving those roads, grading those roads, causing even more impacts to the natural environment. So we're really getting a, 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 an answer from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that uh, is inconsistent uh, with their first determination. So that's very concerning uh, that, uh, that uh, we would have that kind of answer and the kind of uh, response that we've gotten now from Kinder Morgan makes it even more perplexing. Uh, they seem to rely on the fact that they're going to pay property taxes as any utility would uh, in Pima County, and that those would more than offset uh, the impacts. Well, those property taxes for other purposes. Uh, no, they're paying property taxes, but um, that is on a depreciated asset, and um, isn't isn't they? My understanding is they're using some method of accelerated depreciation, so that those tax base will decline over time, while in Maybe I'm mistaken. Our needs will increase over time. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, that's uh, absolutely correct. Centrally assessed utility uh, and their asset will be depreciable, and so the value is based on the depreciated asset. Uh, most uh, use uh, accelerated depreciation. When you look at the obligations of the county, for example, we've talked about it, and this get, get, illustrates the corridor. And, you know, we've we've talked about the need to mitigate this second corridor coming from the border. Uh, while we can manage State Route 286 because it's contiguous and you see who's on it, uh, what we're effectively doing is creating a, another uh, vehicular corridor a few miles west of, of uh, 286 uh, for um, smuggling and the things that occur with regard to what the sheriff is, is doing with his border unit all, all the time along the border. And so, the sheriff's costs that are imputed into this mitigation package aren't going to decline over time. They're not going to depreciate. They're going to inflate, and so they're going to grow. And so uh, I think that's what makes uh, the communication a little disconcerting with the fact that there's little realization of the reality of the impact that this particular facility will have on the county. Uh, and lastly, I think we owe it to our partners in the Altar Valley, the ranchers, to continue to support their activities and, and their interest, and, and they continue to be opposed to this pipeline without adequate mitigation. And uh, I think the, the mitigation that's being offered by Kinder Morgan to the ranching community in Altar Valley is entirely inadequate. Madam Chair. Supervisor Mellon. Mr. Huckberry, I have a question for you. Um, did the Fish and Wildlife Service give us any rationale for their decision do you have any input or any feedback from them on this? Madam Chair and Supervisor Miller, we uh, uh, requested uh, information, we requested reconsideration. They have a process that, call, that they call uh, the internal consistency, in which uh, the federal rules allow them to make a decision uh, without public notice, without public process, without uh, anything. And they just made that decision to support their wildlife refuge manager, even though in other locations in this country there has been pipelines that have been through uh, wildlife refuges with adequate mitigation. And, and we felt all along that this is the best route, least impact, least uh, you know, environmentally damaging alternative, 
but uh, we were frankly ignored uh, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Madam Chair. Supervisor Elias. You know, I have great concerns about this, and, and frankly, I had concerns before we received this letter last night, and after reading through 13 pages of intense denial, uh, I have even more concerns about it. Um, there's serious denial of uh, mitigation standards that are appropriate for um, this type of intrusion into um, real estate in Pima County. Uh, absolutely um, no regard for um, those roads that Mr. Huckleberry talked about that will be not only cut in new places but maintained in new places. Uh, that is going to seriously change the landscape there in the Altar Valley. Uh, this is a region that's particularly volatile to all of us as well. Um, when the issue of, of uh, public safety costs and costs with our sheriff were brought up in relation to immigration as well, uh, again, a complete denial about the whole cost of all of that. I, I think it's important that we get some cost analysis from the Border Patrol as well, who are not included in these questions. Uh, because this is opening an entire new corridor, uh, roadway in that area that has been particularly volatile, volatile and uh, had a number of uh, immigration corridors in it. Um, but even worse, even worse, those uh, corridors have resulted in vigilantism uh, that has cost the county a ton of money as well, trying to control. And so um, the cost of all of that need to be incorporated and calculated into any kind of agreement we have. So I think that the agreement that we have on the table leaves us pretty short, to be quite honest. Uh, and, and that's not really delving into the intricacies of, of the cultural resources of the Tahan Ata people, who uh, have the Babakiwiri Mountains as their most sacred places. Uh, in their existence. Uh, they will be deeply affected by uh, this pipeline that's basically going in at the foot of that uh, set of mountains. Um, that is a serious problem for us as well. That needs to be addressed uh, somehow with the nation and uh, with a certain amount of understanding from Pima County, who also works to uh, protect the cultural resources of the Tahana Hanta Nation. Uh, that's a mutual uh, thing that we've agreed to and we've always conducted. Uh, the seriousness of this matter cannot be uh, uh, blown off or changed easily with a letter that uh, says that you know all of this is untrue. Uh, it looks to me that, that if we want to uh, extend this matter until the first meeting in May, that that's an okay start. But I'm not sure that we can, 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 can complete all the work that needs to be done on this uh, by that first meeting in May. So I, I would say that we want to hear back from Mr. Huckleberry before that first meeting to make sure that uh, these meetings have gone as, as well as they could have and that we come up with some kind of agreement. Because I hate to have us come up with another 13-page letter the night before a meeting. As you can see, they're not here today. We haven't really had a great deal of conversation with these folks as it is. Uh, this is a serious problem. And let me tell you one more thing. Kenya Morgan and those pipelines have an immense amount of power. In District 5, we had a Kinder Morgan gas line burst, and uh, it doused six homes that were under construction over there by Silverbelt and Grant with gasoline. Kinder Morgan was never able to tell us how much gasoline was lost in that event. I don't know about you guys, but when I go buy gas, they know how much down to the last penny goes in that car or down that tube. So it seems to me they ought to be able to figure out how much gas went out that, that, that big pipeline when it popped. So recognizing that there's federal regulatory authority over pipelines, the Office of Pipeline Safety decided to find Kinder Morgan for that accident that took place on Silver Bowl and Grant. The amount of the fine was $35,000. Piva County was fined $1 million for a catastrophic sewer collapse that ended up uh, sending some raw sewage down a, uh, down a storm drain and into the Santa Cruz River. We were fined $1 million for that. There's some basic inequities here, is what I'm saying. 
and these are very, very powerful people. Um, this letter of denial strikes a very bad chord for the future and how we can best work together to mitigate the effects of this pipeline. Um, we might need more than they want, but I'm willing to, to delay at least for a period of time because I think it's our obligation to talk about this because uh, I don't think we have everything included in here that needs to be included. Madam Chair. Supervisor Carroll. Madam Chair, I second the motion for a delay to May 1. I'm not sure if that the is... The first meeting in May. What day is this? May 6th. I'm not exactly sure that's going to be enough time either. I'm certainly flexible to look at that. I appreciate one thing, uh, Supervisor Elias having had experience in his district, I've had a lot of people in this room and appreciate the, the idea that you can only judge a horse by its track record. And uh, on this one, Supervisor Elias, you have my attention and I'm certainly willing to support your delay. Okay, there's a motion and a second. I have a comment. We got this. I actually didn't see it until I got in this morning. It was sent last night, um, and it, it, it has the position of Kinder Market hasn't changed from day one that I can tell. Um, I, they are requesting a meeting, and I did, did not have a letter in front of me when I got the call requesting the continuance. I find that very disingenuous. Um, I am also alarmed after reading the letter how in the letter the Altar Valley Conservation Alliance is basically ignored. Um, our cost to Pima County for mitigation issues is um, grossly underestimated. Um, they were requesting a meeting with the Board of Supervisors. I think prior to any meeting with the Board of Supervisors, which will be an open meeting by law, that Kinder Market needs to sit down with all the stakeholders, as Mr. Huckleberry has indicated, and those include the Altar Valley Conservation Alliance. They include, um, I think, if we can get members of the nation uh, as it relates to the cultural resources, as well as the Sonoran Desert uh, Protection uh, Coalition. Um, these are all stakeholders in this process and should be at the table. I think the other um, entity that needs, besides Kinder Morgan, to be at the table in those discussions is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'm hoping that um, perhaps we can get a representative from um, uh, Congressman Grijalva's office um, at, at any meetings or talks that do take place. And if you will condition your motion on that, I would be happy to support it. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I agree to those conditions to uh, my motion. Supervisor Carroll, are you? Madam Chair, I, I agree. Okay, we have a motion on the floor with direction then. Madam Chair. Supervisor Miller. I just wanted to comment. It was the uh, Kinder Morgan request that this continuance. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. There's a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? Hearing none, any objections? Motion carries. We'll continue until the first meeting in May, which is May 6th. And I know we have several speakers who are here. Ivy, we've got copies of the Kinder Morgan letter if you'd like to look at it. Thank you. Moving back to, do we, Lee Bennett, do we want to take a break now or do we, we're, okay, we'll take about a 10 minute break and then we'll return at the sound of the gavel. Give our folks.
uh, con uh, contract with the U.S. Department of the Interior Geological Survey. What's the pleasure of the board? Madam Chair, I'll go ahead and move item six. I, somebody just did. Was it oh, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. I apologize. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Are there? Is there a discussion? Do I hear objections? Hearing none. Motion carries. Moving on to the consent calendar as amended. Uh, call to the public. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address us on any item on the consent calendar? Oh, sure. Thank you. If not, what's pleasure of the board? Madam Chair. Supervisor Miller. Madam Chair, I move to approve. In its entirety as amended? Yes. Motion and a second to approve, uh, um, approve a consent uh, in its entirety as amended. Discussion? Objections? Uh, hearing none, motion carries. Uh, moving on to Sheriff, item number nine transfer of ownership and title of vehicle. What's pleasure of the board? Second. Motion and a second to approve item nine. Discussion, objections, hearing none, motion Madam carries. Chair. Supervisor Carroll. Just want to say a big thank you to the Sheriff's Department for participating in the request of the Southern Arizona Rescue Association. I've met recently with the board members of Southern Arizona Rescue and you know times are tough over there and they appreciate this donation of a former vehicle used by the Sheriff's Department. And I want to say thank you to all the volunteers and board members of the <coughs> Arizona Rescue Association. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Supervisor Carroll. There were no objections, so motion carries. Uh, moving on to hearings, um, licenses, franchises, permits. Item 10, it's a liquor license. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the board on this item? If not, what's pleasure of the board? Madam Chair. Supervisor Elise. I'll move of item 10, a liquor license for Daniel Dominic's Borgado Vivachi Restaurant and close public hearing. Second. Motion and the second to approve. Objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to item 11, items 11 A and B. And uh, these are amendments to county bond ordinances and bond program updates. Um, relating to ordinance number 2014 and ordinance 2014-14 and 2014-15. Uh, we have a number of speakers. Mr. Huckleberry, comments before I call the speakers up. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chair, this is the members of the board. This is the standard processes that we uh, go through and, and use in monitoring and managing the bond programs and what you have before you are modifications to a number of the projects uh, made necessary during implementation. Uh, the project that you'll probably want to uh, have a separate discussion on is a one in the 2004 program called the 4.31 Northside Community uh, Center, and that is the current uh, amendment that has been recommended to the board by the Mayor and Council. Uh, with regard to amending uh, the allocation of those funds uh, to further improvements at Rito, and that's uh, probably what you'll have many of the speakers on today. Uh, let me hit uh, first uh, the, the modifications that the, the balance of the program are all relatively um, modest and straightforward. I don't think there's many discussions that you're going to have on, on those, and uh, it's how you'd like to proceed uh, with regard to uh, hearing the public's testimony on uh, Project 4.31, uh, and if you like, the staff can answer questions as we go along. Okay, and then the um, store revenue bonds, I don't have any speakers on that item that I'm aware of. Is there anyone in the audience that uh, is here for item 11B in ordinance 2014-15? If not, can we act on that one? No. 2014, this is SOAR. Madam Chair, see that there's no one in the audience who wishes to speak. Oh, is it me? Okay. Um, oh, it's okay. It's not just the sore. A, it's A that's not a question. Okay, my, my mistake. Thank you. Um, so, ordinance 2014-14, the 1997 um, bond implementation plan. What's pleasure board on that item? Madam, 
Supervisor Carroll. Seeing that there's no one to speak on ordinance number 2014-14, 11A under the administrator, I'd like to close the public hearing and move to approve the amendments to county bond ordinances and program update. Motion and a second to approve ordinance 2014-14. Discussion? Objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Now we'll move on to item 11B in ordinance 2014-15. Um, I, we have a number of speakers. I wanted to remind you when you come up to the uh, podium, please uh, give us your name. You have, uh, you're limited to three minutes. Uh, and uh, with that, I will call the first individual, Mark White. Thank you. Patty Shirley. I'm Patty Shirley, Vice President of the Pima County Horsemen's Association. I was really hoping some other people would speak first so that I would have something to speak to. But You're always good at speaking to people. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm, our concern, the Pima County Horsemen's concern, with the plan to destroy the barns on the west end and hopefully build new ones on the east end. We're concerned about the destruction because of the historic significance of those barns. 
we're concerned about the reconstruction because they will be reconstructed in our parking. Now we've been told this isn't going to impact racing. Well now, y'all may not be horse racing fans, but you are business people. Now tell me that you can have a business and take away its parking and that business can continue to thrive. It cannot happen. If you're, you are going to go out for dinner and you have choice A, this restaurant that has lovely parking, or you have to walk a mile and a half to get into the rest of this other restaurant, you will not go to the other restaurant. Since we only have one horse racing facility in all of Southern Arizona, we need to make it customer friendly, consumer friendly, business friendly, so that people can get to this facility that they want to visit. And we're very, very concerned about the constraints that were placed on us if our parking lot is taken. And there's no way that those barns can be built as intended without taking up over half of our parking places. I'm told that a parking garage costs $14 million. I don't think any of you have that in your pockets to pass out. Uh, we need this plan that Mark has that you have not had an opportunity to look at is good for you because I believe in reading the Daily Star that uh, Pima County has come under a lot of criticism for the, all the money they spend and spend improperly. We think this will save you all a lot of money because it's going to cost a fortune to tear down the barns. It's not cheap to demolish. Uh, demolition isn't cheap. It's going to cost another fortune to rebuild. So if we can help you out along those lines and help ourselves as well, we would really appreciate that. And I want you to know we have never been opposed to soccer. We are opposed to soccer putting us out of business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair. Supervisor Lee. Number one, I'm not really aware of any improper spending that Pima County has done. People question some of the things we do, but I have not heard of any um, improper spending that we do. Yeah. However, Mr. Huckleberry, I'd like you to respond to the speaker's uh, comments about the barns on the west side, the parking issues related to it, and um, what exactly is the current plan for that? Yes, uh, Madam Chair and Supervisor Elias, uh, I think what you're you're looking at and, and what we have indicated to everyone, this is the third phase of improvements at Rehito. And as these improvements continue over time, uh, and uh, the improvements are basically creating a public park out of the Rehito racetrack facility. Um, first authorized in 1997 bonds approved by the voters for certain uh, soccer improvements uh, at the facility. Additional funding was authorized in 2004, and those improvements have been installed. Uh, this is the third round of, of improvements that go and address uh, increasing soccer capacity of the facility. And it arises out of uh, an allocation that was made to the city of Tucson. So what we're really talking about is this third allocation of bond funding uh, that makes further improvements to soccer but begins to displace existing facilities that are on the Rito, specifically the barns on the west side. And a portion of those barns are not occupied now because they were damaged in the previous windstorm. The reason that we're looking at the west side is simply because we also need to develop what we call flood detention and retention basins because of something called racetrack wash that comes through the middle of the Rito. Um, we're perfectly willing to look at any other alternative that anyone wants to propose, including the one that Mark White just provided us. We will look at that. I think there's been this uh, concept that we're rushing to, to tear down the barns so that we can you know, permanently put out a business horse racing, and that's not true. We've said from time to time, and every time we're asked, we said that we will not do anything until after the 2014 racing season. That's been really interpreted is that we're going to go tear down the barns tomorrow. We're not. Um, and what we will be doing is looking at any reasonable alternative that anybody wants to bring forward to us uh, that allows an alternative to be put in place that continues to expand the capacity of retail for public park use. And that includes county fair horse racing. 
Um, we anticipate that County Fort Worth racing will probably continue uh, from, say, today of this last season to more than likely through 2018. Again, because there will be another public vote on the Rito. Uh, and the other public vote is now being under consideration by the Pima County Bond Advisory Committee that would add an additional uh, bonding allocation to uh, complete the transition from a uh, present condition as a, as a park to then full soccer complex development. Uh, but that has to be voted on by a, a bond issue that could be, could be on the ballot as early as November 15. Now, we have also said on, on numerous occasions that we're perfectly willing to look at and even go back and recommend different alternatives to the Bond Advisory Committee, provided that we can ensure the facility is multiple use. Uh, and multiple use means, yes, we've looked at an alternative. We looked at one alternative that's been well documented, and we can pull it out and look at it again. And I asked the very simple question, can the grandstands be retained in their present location, retain the track configuration as it is, and, and have those grandstands used as multiple use for soccer tournament facilities? And, and the answer comes back, no, because they're too far away uh, from the playing field. We just built a new soccer tournament complex on Kino. And so we could do that, but we have to come to the realization, everybody does, that we're going to have to rebuild the grandstand closer to the playing surfaces and closer to the running surfaces that takes out the patio area in front of the present grandstands. Uh, but that's a, that's a bond issue, and we've not had many people talk about that as a joint use facility for soccer tournament complex as well as retaining horse racing. We also know that there are several competing entities now with regard to uh, leasing the facility for future county fair horse racing, and, and that they may have other concepts or plans, and again, we will look at those. Uh, and I think in order to allay everybody's fears that we're going to, once the board acts, if the board acts or if you want to act on uh, the proposed amendment, uh, we're going to go out and, and, and and destroy barns and proceed with the phased improvements that we plan. We do not have any contracts to do that. We don't have any specific plans. Uh, we're just now beginning that planning process to what occurs. Happy to involve everyone in the process, including the soccer interest in that process, so that everybody has a, a decision or an input into the decision. And ultimately, whatever we do, we're going to have to bring right back to this Board of Supervisors for your ultimate approval and direction. So that may, may help lay the foundation for what we have as additional speakers and, and what the county plans. And uh, the county plans at this time are I think, pretty much as outlined in uh, that uh, discussion. Thank you. Supervisor Carroll. Chair, I'd like to ask Mr. Huckleberry again. When it came to Patty Shirley's comments, um, their, their lease is up in two years, am I right, Mr. Huckleberry? Southern Arizona Horsemen's Association. Madam Chair and Supervisor Carroll, it's the uh, Pima County Horsemen's Association. Their lease is up now. Their lease is already up, so they're on a month to month over there. No, no, I think no, there, be, there has to be a new request for proposals for leasing of the facility, which is in preparation now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Carroll. Um, we'll proceed with the speakers. Um, and uh, I apologize, I uh, failed to recognize um, as we started this meeting uh, the supervisor who I replaced, Supervisor Ed Morris, Supervisor Moore. Please come to the podium. I have a green bag that I did not bring up. Thank you. <laughs> uh, there, there are two things that you need to pay attention to. That initiative that the heavy majority of the voters approved in 1984 is still alive and well. Do not listen to anybody who says it is expired. Section 1 dealt with 
general issues dealing with the Rito racetrack. Section 2 dealt with commercial horse racing. Because remember, Pima County fired 1,800 people when they terminated the racetrack lease. You can go back to the number of licenses held at the track at that point. At the same time, Section, th or section 3 of the initiative dealt with county fair racing. So two and three have expired because the 25 years for those two types of racing are over. Section four is still alive and well. And section five forces the county to recognize the history of that particular track. Mo Udall suggested that this lease, that this initiative be written. I can give you the history of that if you want it, but it takes a little bit of time. Uh, he said, make sure you put an ordinance in there and don't put a provision where the county supervisors can vote on it. Look at the very last line in the initiative. It says the Pima County Board of Supervisors cannot do anything about it. That means, and incidentally, Alvin Kreitz, who is no longer with us, agreed with Mo Udall. Uh, as you remember, Mo Udall was a county attorney in I think 52 and 53, and was fully aware of a number of issues in regard to the Rito racetrack. The history is important. That, in my opinion, is the most important issue. That's the one if you guys pass something today, I would ask that you publicly delay doing anything to the barns, uh, because if we have to, we will go into court and try and litigate to enforce the provisions of the lease that require you to protect what is there. Uh, we think you have to go back to the public if you don't like the particular provisions. And somebody's after me. No, it's okay. You just dropped his <laughs> Anyway, uh, in addition, the decision by the appellate court in Maricopa County last year in the Castle Rock issue was quite definitive. The Supreme Court agreed with the appellate court's published decision. You cannot amend a bond issue without going back to a vote of the people. Now, the law is very clear on that. If we have to litigate that issue also, we're ready and willing to do it. I'm not fighting for either of the groups that plan to lease the range or would like to lease it. I'm fighting to preserve the improvements that are there. So, anyway, thanks, guys. Thank you, Supervisor. Ralph Comey. Uh, hello, my name is Ralph Comey. I'm the historic architect. And my colleague, Janet Parker, is denied. Uh, well, the National Register nomination that put the... Yeah, we need you to... That has the title. Just we'll speak into it? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, we wrote the nomination for the Rita Racetrack and put it on the National Register uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, I just wanted to speak in support of the track. Uh, Pima County plans soon to demolish two historic horse barns on the retail racetrack property, add new consolidated barns in one location, and add three new soccer fields. This does not make good sense. Currently, there are four soccer fields in the infield of the racetrack, 160 more soccer fields in the Tucson area, and a proposed tournament site to the west of town. Moreover, with this change in the track, there will not be sufficient on-site parking. Perhaps more fields are needed, but they should not come at the expense of this historic racetrack. Rico Racetrack is listed on the National Register of Historic Places because the official quarter horse racing started here. A portion of the track, the straightaway chute, is listed at the national level of significance. In Tucson, Santa Fe Mission and Tumacock Hill Desert Laboratory <coughs> are the only other properties listed at this level. So Rita Racetrack is a unique historic property.
This racetrack has always enjoyed considerable popular support. During the racing season, large crowds and good weather often exceeding 5,000 people attend the weekend races. Uh, Tucson no longer has Major League Baseball spring practice. Next year we may lose match play golf. We are losing top level sporting events. So Tucson's racing season is important. We urge the Board of Supervisors to support and protect Reed the Racetrack. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Janet Paul first. Members of the Board of Supervisors, um, I am also a preservation architect. I am Janet Parker, you just heard. Um, I am here sort of for more personal reasons. One is my very good friend, Mary, is the daughter of Mel Haskell, one of the original founders of um, organized um, quarter horse racing at the Rito. Very good friend of Jay Rukin Jelks. And um, Mary's um, suffering in uh, poor health right now, and, and I'm here on her behalf because I know she'd love to be here. Um, I am speaking just on one aspect of the Rito. I almost wished I could have spoken after Ricardo Pineda, the Consul of Mexico, was here this morning. Um, I know of no better agent for cross-border goodwill than the Rito racetrack. Have you ever been there? <laughs> Um, I, yo hablo espanol también. I see um, families all decked out. Um, I, I talk to people who said they, they were raised on the racetrack as children because their parents brought them there for their main entertainment. <laughs> um, I, I think this is um, an irreplaceable resource and, as I said, agent of um, cross-border goodwill. Please keep that in mind. Please attend the races if you haven't. You'll never have so much fun. <laughs> Richard, is it Pasco, Dasco? Thank you. I'm known as Rick Pasco, P-A-S-K-O, and I live at 13663 North Bushwhacker Place in Oro Valley. Well, I've been, let's see, we bought a house here uh, oh, five years ago. I came back. I'm a displaced uh, U of A grad in 1958. I was here when the mountains, you could see them, but no, up at the bottom. And uh, you're not going to excuse me. I have Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease has changed my, my personality, and sometimes I just, I'll, I'll whimper over things I shouldn't be, usually wonder why I'm whimpering. Anyway, that, that, that's my, my problem. And I will fight that one, and I'm going to fight it, and I will win. Because I do win most of the time, except in, in this case, I got hit with Parkinson's six years ago. And uh, I graduated from U of A in 1958 in, in advertising and in uh, business. I'll tell you, I got a good education because I did very, very well in advertising. But I'm not here. Up in Seattle, I ran an advertising agency and did quite well. And it was interesting to see the, the proclamations of it today because I would, I'm a believer that women have been underpaid, too. And it worked for women and their copywriting, their copywriting techniques and all the abilities that they had. I wouldn't be here today in the financial position I'm in. And I've been very, very well. I, I would. I came here and I said, why, why am I here today? Because we're only the Dallas. I got in the horse business some, uh, oh gosh, 40 years from now. 40 years ago when I bought a horse for $2,000 and it won $50,000 and ever since then I've been having horses. It took me, it took me yeah, 40 years to get to Santa Anita. And I've got one running this Thursday, if you look at it. In the seventh race, her name is Mark of a Gem. And she's a, she, she won, she's a, 
She could be a big one. Four year old, and she's going to have the best jockey in the world on her, Smith, Mike Smith. And it's an interesting fact that knowing, knowing people in the horse business is a very, 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 quite rewarding to me. Because if you want good citizens, they're going to come from their horses. And uh, looking back when I first got in, Everybody, if you've been at the racetrack, you're looking at the front side. You're not seeing the really people who run the racetrack, the people that backstretch. A typical racetrack is about, oh, let's see, in Seattle, we have 500 people back there. We have, a, we have a, a, a cafe, we have a minister, we have a Catholic minister, we have a, a general minister. And they work together very, very well. And uh, it's like a little city. And Basically, if uh, somebody's hurt, you got the HPPA, which is an organization that takes care of the people back there. If they're hurt financially, they'll help them. If they can't uh, buy food, they'll help them. And the miracles happen back there. And these, these are the, in fact, my wife, I prayed for her twice since she's at worst home. And uh, this is. This, this, She's taking care of me now. She took care of her. And what I'd like to do is make, make, make this mention. You know, the month of April nationally is going to be Parkinson's Awareness Month. And we're into it now. And I saw nothing in the press here. And that is one of my vocations and that I'm going to be doing now in my retirement years is to work towards Parkinson's activity to get funding for it. Because you've got one, one basic person who's pushing it. It's Michael J. Fox and doing a great job. But Yesterday, I received notice from him that uh, they are coming very close to bringing out a, a drug that could very well delay the progress of the disease. And when you're when you get Parkinson's, the average age is 60 years old. And uh, it's not fun because once you get it, you like going to prison for life. There's no cure for it yet. And there's a lot of it. That sounds pretty. Uh, I'm here today because I saw an article on the paper yesterday to say really good now. I, I, I'm somewhat embarrassed when I walk through Tucson and once you've been to this town. In 1958, you had the Hockenese shoe store, no, the department store, go in there. It's the only group, uh, uh, the only place to work, I worked there part time my way through school. I worked on ranches here. I worked at, with Pat Jenks. He had a 28,000 acre ranch. Passed down. He's a great, great gentleman. Uh, he owned by um, his peak. And he released some of the land from her. And go up there and fix trails every weekend. Uh, and it was very, very enjoyable. I enjoyed my life here, and I enjoyed my life outside here. But I came back, and I was somewhat dis discouraged to see a golf tournament with uh, a purse of five million dollars. And now they're not going to be here. And when I was here, uh, I said, "Well, what's you know, this rodeo that they've got here? Why aren't they supporting a rodeo with more funding?" I think you're, you're, yeah, your time, your time has elapsed, but. I, I assume that you're. I assume that you're obviously supportive of the track and want to keep it. Okay. National something you should keep it. I'd have more money to it. In fact, I was going to go to them and see if we could do some kind of funding for it. Because you know what? If you really look at it, the states of this country took away horse racing from them. They took away farming, hurt the farmers more than they did horse racing. Because the lottery in 1982, they almost destroyed. Horse racing. The tenants there and of course our ownership is just depleted. And as you do something, <laughs> and I was going to go to the, and I did it in Washington, and I'm going to work with this to see if they could pay back the horsemen through the lottery and raise some funds that way to bring back horse racing. Thank you so much. Madam Chair. Supervisor. Mr. Pasco, I want to say thank you for your comments and obviously. Yeah. Horse racing is the number one spectator sport in the world. It's close. But I will say that I have been to the racetrack, and, uh, but on the other mention that you had there in your comments, uh, the best boss I ever had was Sister Kathleen Clark from Casa de los Niños. I worked for her. 
while she suffered from Parkinson's disease. And I'm glad you reminded us that April is Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. I have friends that I'll be uh, helping to get this notion out that it's curable. I'm glad Michael J. Fox communicated with you that something's on the horizon. So I appreciate you coming in today and how much uh, we all agree on, on so many different items. We'll uh, be happy to meet with you after the agenda uh, is over today officially and love you as a stakeholder and an idea person for how to make things better in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Carroll. Um, Jeffrey Rogers. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, I'm Jeff Rogers. I'm the Director of Coaching for the Tucson Soccer Academy. I'm also uh, a member of the Arizona Youth Soccer Association's State League Subcommittee. I'm also a liaison for the USYSA, which is the United States Youth Soccer Association's uh, Far West Regional League, um, and a liaison for Tucson and trying to bring that here. Um, I wanted to talk about the conversion of Rito into soccer fields and specifically into the number of fields that are necessary in order to bring large scale events. Um, the USYSA has deemed 16 fields as the benchmark for bringing any kind of large event into the area. Currently we have to travel to Las Vegas, Albuquerque, even Phoenix at times. Uh, last summer our team that won the state championship had to go to Hawaii in order to participate in the regional championships. And it's always very frustrating for me because I think those events should be here. And they could be if we had a facility, and this has been expressed to us many times by the leadership of the USYSA, of the regional staff. Um, they all recognize Tucson as, as a beautiful destination for tourism. And I think that what's happened out at Keno, where we built a facility, and now the MLS is using that as their preseason, um, has established that, that people want to come to Tucson, and especially soccer people. And this is now becoming kind of a focused hub uh, for these events. But until we have a facility that can accommodate the number of teams that we're talking about, and that's what it all comes down to, when you have a youth soccer event with 200, 250 teams, and that's what these have, the economic impact is enormous. And they have to be at one facility from a management standpoint. They won't allow these to be broken up six fields here, six fields across the other side of town, six fields somewhere else. It's all got to be in one centralized location. Um, so I, I hope you will give every consideration to this. Uh, again, the impact will, will be enormous on it. I'd also like to say that I'm a physical education teacher. I'm certified in elementary school PE. And so I'm very sensitive to the issues that our youth are facing right now. Uh, of course, of the sedentary lifestyles that so many of them have and the opportunities that we're trying to present to them to be active, to get outside, to participate in helpful, life-affirming activities. And that's ultimately what soccer is providing for these kids. And what's beautiful about soccer is, again, that it bridges the socioeconomic bridge of, uh, of backgrounds and, and ethnic backgrounds. It brings kids from all diversity together. Um, and it's very inexpensive to play relative to some of the other sports. And, and I think that we all, as the leadership of our community, have a responsibility to these kids, to provide these opportunities for them. In addition to the other side of it, which is the economic impact it will make. So for me, it's a win-win situation that if you were to convert Rito into 16 fields, make it a quality facility, not only are you improving the facilities available to our youth, but you're also enabling large-scale events to come to Tucson and improve the economic impact. Thank you. You forgot one thing. You're interested in co-locating soccer and horse racing and Rito, is this correct? That is correct. You're willing to participate in a project that's going to bring both a lasting home and absolutely, absolutely beneficial arrangement? I, you know, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm from Tucson. I was raised here. I've spent my entire life in Tucson. I, I do go off and I was a professional soccer player for 11 years and then I returned. 
And I recognize that horse racing is, is an important part of our culture. And I don't think any of us in the soccer community want to see horse racing go away. That is not our ambition. Just as they state, their ambition is not to make soccer go away. And I, I think we all want there to be a coexistence. Um, we just have to look at the realities of limited space, limited resources, and try and figure out the best way to best serve everyone. Thanks, Mr. Rogers. I appreciate listening to you say that. The other thing is, I was at the TSA uh, and Schmidt Clubhouse opening. You guys did a fabulous job there. You took what was a real hovel and turned it into a house and gardens facility for the pride of Pima County and the soccer, so, soccer clubs. And, uh, that meet there and benefit from the homework help and all the other amenities that are offered. So um, in blessed memory, I say thanks to Ann Schmidt, Ted Schmidt, and all the people that helped you at that TSA facility. It's really top drawer. If people haven't been there and understood the kind of work that you do, and like you said, you don't need to have a silver spoon in your mouth when you're born. You don't need a club tie to be a member of that club. You just have to have a desire to kick up some dirt and uh, work your soccer skills till you get to a, a high school or college and find your skills something that they want on their team. I appreciate also you being a professional from Tucson and coming home here. Uh, nice job on your career. But most of all, thanks again for being here and speaking out. And obviously, it's a, uh, you're, you're outnumbered today, sir. But I'm glad to hear you say that you're more than willing to lay down any animosity and move towards a mutual beneficial coexistence in, uh, in, in, this, in the Rito corridor for soccer and horse racing. Horse racing. Thank you. Thank you so much for those kind words. I Madam Chair, sure. Supervisor Miller, I'd just like to ask Mr. Rogers a few questions. Have you seen this concept that was drawn? Yes, I have. And, and it's got 11 soccer fields. I'm just looking at you know, how we could possibly get 16 soccer fields on there. I don't know if there's a, is there other area that I'm not seeing that exists? Mr. Huggle there? Yes, um, Madam Chair and Supervisor Miller, there's a final phase improvement, which is a $14 million additional investment. And that is before the Bond Advisory Committee that would add the other fields. It basically requires the removal of the horse racing facilities. <laughs> Jim Cosby. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good concept. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, Jim Cosby from Sonoida, and I'm uh, here um, basically wearing three hats. Uh, first of all, I am president of the uh, Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds uh, down in Sonoida. Also, I'm the third uh, year chairman for the Sonoida Horse Races, which are coming up uh, Kentucky Derby weekend um, in about three weeks. And finally, I'm a board member of the Arizona County Racing Association. And uh, so, three hats. Uh, I want to speak basically on uh, uh, one thing, and that is, of course, uh, Every action, uh, it is well known, causes a reaction, or every cause that causes an effect. And um, a little history here, in 2010, the uh, Arizona State Legislature cut what was known as betterment funding. This was funding that was uh, given to all the uh, county um, racetrack, uh, rodeo and, and racetrack uh, facilities, county fairs, and uh, those funds were used to support horse racing in, um, in Arizona on the county, county level. That funding dried up. What was the effect or the reaction? One year later, um, there were uh, 12 um, statewide county racing facilities that could not provide racing. That has happened then. The next year, the next year, and, the, and then this is the fourth year that no county racing has um, occurred, with the exception of Sonoya, uh, Santa Cruz County. Um, that is a, um, an actual uh, action-reaction. We're now looking at a potential action 
of the possible altering of the uh, uh, Rideau track so that horse racing possibly will no longer be viable in Pima County. Okay, what is the reaction? The reaction is threefold. Number one, you must know that approximately two-thirds of the horses that come to Santa Cruz County to race at the Sonoida meet come after Rito, uh, Rito's meet uh, uh, is, is finished. The bottom line is no Rito horses means no horses coming to Sonoida, which means Sonoida racetrack closes. And the bottom line, if you take it one step further, since racing is the primary funding source for Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds, um, our facility is in, is in jeopardy of its uh, ultimate existence. The second thing you need to know is that um, the racetrack industry program at the University of Arizona um, has been using uh, both Rito and... Sir, your uh, time has expired. Could you wrap up quickly? Okay. Um, the bottom line, I guess, is, uh, is, is money. Um, county racing in Arizona, if that disappears and becomes extinct, in effect, we will be losing statewide up to 5,000 jobs, $110 million in income to households, and $19 million in revenues to state and local governments. So um, horse racing decisions in Pima County certainly affect horse racing throughout Arizona. Sir, Thank if you, you have the remarks written, you're welcome to submit them to the clerk and we'll put them on. I, I basically just have it in okay. outline form. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Kurt Luscom. Good morning. My name is Kurt Luscom. I guess we answered the coexistence question. They tear down the racetrack, soccer and racing can't coexist. Um, we have a unique situation in Pima County in that we have an operational racetrack that is, sits on county land. I think it's a great opportunity that we may be throwing away. Uh, it was gifted to the county in the 70s. There's eight soccer fields now in use. And your plan is to demolish the entire historic district by 2018. To build 16... Uh, that's what Mr. Huckleberry I would ask said. Mr. Huckleberry to correct that statement before uh, you go back to that comment. Yes. <clears throat> no. Mr. Madam Chair and Supervisor, I guess what I said is that the current plan, uh, which is uh, the third phase of improvements, would be a future bond issue in 2015 that would complete and add a number of fields uh, to 16. And in that phase, if in fact is approved, that shows that the racing facilities would be demolished and removed. What I've also said is that we have been perfectly open uh, to any coexisting use uh, that can improve the multiple use of the facilities. Right now, uh, there is limited multiple use, particularly at the grandstand facilities. The only way in which you can improve that use is to ensure the grandstand facilities are used for soccer tournaments or other facilities. And no one has yet come forward with any particular plan or alternative to how to reuse those facilities or reuse that configuration by re and retain the existing track configuration so that horse racing can continue, but the use can be more multiple use than it is today. And we're open to those alternatives. But the Bond Advisory Committee and others, and other committees have previously made decisions with regard to how to proceed. And so we're kind of getting at the end of that process. So if there's a viable alternative that's going to come forward, it needs to come forward relatively soon. Okay. So I just wanted okay. to make sure that you got that this has got to go. If there's any changes that would end racing, essentially, it's got to be approved by the voters via any changes in bond. As it stands right now, racing's going to go on there for a long time. Okay? How we go about doing that is. Excuse me, sir? I, I don't believe you. You don't believe me? Okay, thank you. All right, let me continue. Do I get my three minutes again? Yeah, we stopped the call. Okay, thank you. So we have this unique situation. The problem I see is 
putting soccer fields at the Rideau Racetrack is ill-conceived. There's not enough room to have 16 fields in parking as per the memorandums of Mr. Huckleberry. And in order to build it, you're going to have to put a parking garage in there. So let's go about the cost that we have into the project now and what it's going to cost to put these 16 fields there. There's about $5 million in improvements, which are the existing soccer fields and the repairs that were done to the grandstand. There's $12 million that you're going to throw away in the replacement cost of the Riga racetrack, and that's a conservative estimate. There's $5.25 million that you're voting on today to do the demolition of the barns and move the barns, which indeed, if the track is closed down, the, all the money you spent to move the barns is wasted, and I calculated it at or $800,000. There's $14 million in the 2015 bond proposed to finish the project, and there'll be another $14 million to put in a parking garage. So if you add that up quickly, it's $50 million for 16 soccer fields. You need to justify this expenditure for 16 soccer fields to the taxpayers, to the voters, to the horsemen, to the race fans, to the historical fans, and to the voters. I think the best thing to do is leave Rito Racetrack exactly as, as it is and find another piece of property, build an 18-field national tournament site for youth soccer, and retain the, the project that we have out there now. I think you need to leave Rito Racetrack as it is. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Luskin. Supervisor, Madam Chair, you know, I, I can respect everybody's uh, opinion on, on this particular subject, and I think it's important, and I, I think it's important that we come up with a, a good, appropriate, multi-purpose multi use uh, for this facility, to be quite honest. That includes horse racing. But I'd be very careful about people who spread misinformation in public uh, without regard for what uh, um, information is an actually true and fact. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie Maven. Madam Chair, I was actually going to speak a little bit more to the renewal of the, the lease, and I didn't know if I should wait until the call to the public, or if you'd like to hear it now. Since renewal of the lease. Well, uh, the lease for. The renewal of the lease. Uh, for your retail. Mm -hmm. uh, call, call to the public. Okay. Hang on. Sorry. Alex Lee. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alex Lee. I'm John Goodman's grandson. Um, I want to speak today. Oh, and, and John Goodman's next, so you're going to call him. Perfect. We'll, we'll, do a, we'll do a better job than I will. Um, I thought that I had a unique perspective in the fact that I grew up here in town, um, played soccer all of my life till I got to high school, and switched to football and received a uh, football scholarship to college. Um, I owe soccer a lot in this town. But um, the Reed to a racetrack, uh, I believe, is worth so much more than soccer. Um, there's so few things for, for young people to go see horses and, and something of, of um, that grandeur. Uh, I grew up um, working for Fred Fry because I, I loved all things equine, and I worked in those barns that we're talking about tearing down, uh, moving sawdust in and out. Um, there's, there's uh, um, a very, very few options for, for children to see horses and be around that. Um, and I, I hold it so dear to my heart that I got to go with my grandfather um, on uh, weekends. And I think that, that moving those barns to where the parking is is a is a slide in the wrong direction of, of taking something away from the track. It's, it's hard enough as it is for, for the track to, to make a go of it and, and to have um, more congestion in, in parking is, uh, is, is not in the best interest of Reed's track. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. John Goodman. Santa Rita Hotel 
down the valley back. And I went to Evans School, boarding school there. And after World War II, I came back to Tucson. And I've lived in the same home off Camino Real since 1947. So I have a real interest in the community. I'm also the only Arizona that's a member of the Jockey Club, which is the brave registry for thoroughbred horses in the United States. I owned a horse that very few Americans ever achieved, and that was winning the Grand National in England at Aintree, four and a half miles over 30 jumps in 19, uh, yes, that was 1964. And of um, <coughs> all, all my interests really in racing to Ruben Jones, Bob Locke, Clancy Waller, and Jake Meyer, who were really the founders of Rehita. Now, and uh, I, uh, it, to me, it would be like tearing down, um, uh, really, uh, the cathedral to build the shopping center. And uh, I can only say that um, it's, it's, it's a historic place. The, it goes back into Arizona and into racing. It has provided, I was one of the founders of the School of Racetrack Management at the University of Arizona. I just brought millions of dollars to the university in donations and many, many uh, people into the racing industry. And certainly, Rito has been a part of that, employing the students when they were going to school there to learn the trade. I, I, can only urge to please give it very, very serious consideration. I think soccer is great. Don't misunderstand me. I played it when I was a kid. But I also think horse racing is great. And I don't want to see something that is like Arizona's <coughs> Churchill Downs where the Kentucky Derby is run this far. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. Um, Gary Davidson is our final speaker. Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Gary Davidson, 3567 East Sunrise. Um, I didn't bring any charts today. The last time I was before you three years ago, I had a lot of charts and went through a lot of information. I was obviously very persuasive since I lost five to zero uh, on my recommendation to support the Parks Commission uh, rental uh, uh, suggestion. Mr. Huck Huckleberry had a rental suggestion that was much uh, more reduced, and you supported that. Um, I went through the business aspects that day. Of course, I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions on that if you're interested. Um, but today, I kind of want to go back to the basics. Uh, six years, eight years ago now, in 06, uh, the Reed Regional Planning Committee um, that had members that spoke today in favor of the, the horse racing facility at Reed. We came up with a unanimous suggestion, recommendation that was accepted by the board unanimously to move horse racing out of Reed and convert it to a, a, a full-time park with fields. And I should say there are soccer fields, but there's also been football tournaments there, there's rugby tournaments there, they're suitable for lacrosse also. So this goes across all sports. 
I will also take you back to the fact that if you look in our community, and this is what the leadership of our community has created over the years, not me, if you look between Oracle and Craycroft, north of Broadway, there's almost no parks. There's 11 high schools or students from 11 high schools in that area. And I did not create that situation. I'm just trying to remedy it. And I think this is an excellent way to remedy it. If you put 16 fields there, you can provide local access for the kids. And listening today, I, I heard you doing uh, awards for Global Youth Services Day, um, Youth <coughs> HIV, AIDS Awareness Day. Um, Youth Week in Pima County, and I urge you to do something for the young people in Pima County. This is an area, there's no other land available. Uh, the city has already confirmed that, and that's what you're dealing with today. But I urge you to go ahead, add these fields, we'll address the other issue, as was stated before, uh, to Supervisor Elise's question at a later time. Remember, these fields need to be accessible to people who have to get to practice, the kids that live in this area. Many of them were single moms that came up before. They have a real, real tough time getting to practice. So if you put a facility way on the west side or whatever, it won't work. Do it where the kids are. Thank you very much for your time. Um, Mr. Davidson, sure. um, you're also a member of the Bond Advisory Committee. I am. And this, is a, this ordinance, this change, these amendments are being brought. Uh, in a, they have been approved by the Bond Advisory Committee. They have. It was, it was requested by the city that we make that change did make that change, um, and if you'd like to go into details of, of why that was, I'd be happy to, but yes, we've approved that. Okay. Is there any further questions for Mr. Davidson? If not, thank you, Mr. Davidson. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. What's the pleasure of the board on um, to the, our, well, item 11B, ordinance 2014-15. Supervisor I'm going to go ahead and move item 11B, including item ordinance 2014-15. Uh, uh, this does not commence uh, the destruction of any of the facilities there at Rito, but uh, complete some work that needs to be done. Again, we are willing to continue conversations regarding this issue. Um, horse racing is not a dead issue there at Rito. Um, neither are the other uses that exist there as well. So I think this is something that moves us forward. We have heard your voices. We want to continue hearing your voices, but we also want to make sure that we're sharing accurate information with each other so that we don't uh, become further misinformed and add fuel to what is sure to be a very difficult issue for our community to, to uh, come from. So I'm gonna go ahead and move, uh, like I said, item 11B, including ordinance 2014-15. Close the hearing. Close the hearing. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Um, I would ask the county administrator. We've heard from a number of people. I think they've made some um, very good points. Um, I think uh, Mr. Goodman um, concluding remarks for uh, exemplary. I would hope that as we move forward, should this pass, that we can have we can have a dialogue with all the interested parties um, prior to any um, bond um, a recommendation from the bond committee um, regarding the new election. Um, clearly, we, we've got um, we've got some work ahead of us in all um, respects, but. Uh, this has been approved by the bond committee, and um, I think we need to move forward. So are there any other comments, discussion? Supervisor Miller. Madam Chair, I just had a question. Um, this Passing this ordinance, does this begin the destruction of the barns that aren't in use currently? Madam Chair and Supervisor Miller, what we have indicated that, that what this does is, is accept the city's recommendation to build more soccer facilities on the site. And a part of the current plan does call for those barns on the west side to be removed. But what I've indicated uh, orally in the presentation is that before we do anything to destroy those barns, we will come back to this board with a plan that says, here's either what we can do or what we can't do. And ultimately, it'll be this board's decision. Thank you. 
Any further comments? If not, um, are there any objections? Hearing none, motion carries unanimously. Moving on to the agenda agenda. Item 5, Economic Development and Tourism, Southern Arizona Race Rate, LLC. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your patience in waiting here today. What's a pleasure to board. Madam Chair, Supervisor. I move to approve uh, item five on the agenda, excuse me, on the addendum, uh, Southern Arizona Raceway to provide a ground lease agreement at the Southern Southeast Regional Park for a motorsports raceway attraction. Motion and a second to approve item five, Southern Arizona Raceway LLC. Objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on uh, to item six, bond advisory committee. Um, Appointment of Edward Buster. Um, motion and a second to approve. Objections. Hearing none, motion carries. We're now in call to the audience. Gary Murphy. Good morning, board. We're such good friends, I always forget to introduce myself, but we have people here in the audience. I am Mary Murphy from Green Valley. And just, I want to let everybody know what I was up to last night. My new post, 66 American Legion post, I was representing everyone at Tucson International Airport to greet the honor flight, bringing our World War II veterans back from Washington, D.C. I hope to do it again, real time, real soon. Post 66 sent a couple of guys. I'm friends with a gentleman in Sarita that was on the trip. They need money, always. Now to get these guys going, the time is a waste. Does Pima County have any kind of matching funds for the, the anything that's raised for Honor Flight Tucson? That's the .com or .org. I'm not sure what it is. It's Honor Flight Tucson, and. Uh, I was blessed to be with them, and by, by doing so, I honored my father and my mother in that fourth commandment. We've recently been talking a bit about the eighth commandment, and I may be speaking to, if he calls me or writes me, is the Pope, because I want him to put out uh, some kind of an encyclical or whatever they do that has to do with false information and the stuff being passed around. Eighth commandment, thou shalt honor, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. This is a biggie. I think the churches all need to pay some attention to it. Uh, the horse thing, I told you all about my famous horse that I got to, I got to see him race in that chariot team, race on Ben Hur, and they win that race. And I got to see something I'd never seen before. It was a training of how they were training them to jump over the chariots and stuff like that. And so you can say whatever you will about me. Say nothing about the horse. I don't know. And hearing about, oh, uh, I called that CMG engineering company and that inspection for the drainage raising to due out for Green Valley's next month. I asked for the first copy, hot off the presses, and anyone else that's as interested as me can get the second copy. Without anything I don't want to do with this. Uh, as 25 washes, we haven't been able to keep track of in Green Valley, and with this Kinder Morgan thing, you're talking 250. So, somewhere along the line, we got to get. It. And, he and uh, I always think of Jackie Kennedy with her beautiful Spanish when she spoke on behalf of her husband and her French. She had to call falling in love with her. Her Spanish went over real well in Mexico, too. And the terms of my probation do not prohibit me from crossing into the country next door. So if you need an ambassador, I'm here. I want to say to the consulate. Muchas gracias. I also want to say, uh, the gentleman speaking about uh, his Parkinson's. I was blessed to take care of my mother in the last stages of her Parkinson's, and I will not let anyone forget what's been done to her house. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie Maven. My name is Stephanie Maven. Um, do you mind, Okay. Um, 
I served on the Pima County Parks Commission, so it's been about three years since I've seen you all. Um, as Gary had mentioned about the, uh, we had proposed a payment schedule for the licensing fee for horse racing. Um, the supervisor day chose to do something uh, much less. But what I wanted to remind you is that that was not an arbitrary <coughs> number that we came up with. The Parks Commission established the payment fee for all tax exempts for all nonprofits. All tax exempts and nonprofits in Pima County are paying the same fee except horse racing. When we started on the commission, they were paying zero to use that facility for three months. It increased to 3750 for three months, whereas other nonprofits were paying up to $7,500 for one weekend. Anything that is less than the established schedule, in my eyes, is a subsidy. And it appears to be favoritism towards one tax exempt versus all the other charities and nonprofits in Pima County. So I'm asking you that if you renew the lease for horse racing, that it finally be put on the same schedule, the same payment schedules as every other nonprofit and every other tax exempt in Pima County. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, one other question since, uh, sure. one other comment since I have time. These people never know how involved my family has been in horse racing, and I'm not going to get into that. But my question is, one of the gentlemen that spoke said that without, when the state withdrew funding, that all of these horse tracks closed. If there is that little interest, why are we subsidizing them? Why are we doing this? Um, if the state finally realized that the money needed to be going to other purposes than horse racing, maybe pull us out 50th in education or something. I think that needs to be taken into consideration. If the interest in horse racing is not what it was 50 or 100 years ago, I don't want my tax money subsidizing it. I, I have huge potholes that are not fixed. I have roads, one pothole that the county came through, they didn't even fix it, it was so big. How can we subsidize horse racing when we can't fix our streets and take care of other business? Thank you. Thank you. Robert Harris. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Robert Harris. I'd like to thank you again for the time that you're going to sit and listen to me. I've got another horse to, to talk about, another dead horse that some people talk about, and that's Rosemont Copper, and the people who support Rosemont Copper. My mission is to educate and oppose the pro proposed Rosemont project in the Santa Rita's. My wife tells me I speak too softly, so I'm trying to speak up. Your comments are loud and clear. Uh, <laughs> they're only supposed to give the permit to Rosemont if they follow all the federal, state, and local laws. One of those would be the Forest Service fined Rosemont Copper $500,000 for starting a fire a couple years ago. Rosemont has basically ignored the fine and ignored the Forest Service. Uh, March 15th, I went to a supervisor's meet and greet with Supervisor Miller at the Bear Canyon Library, and we discussed the sales tax and. Supervisor Miller, paraphrasing this, said, well, the unincorporated area is 6.5 to 7.1, somewhere around there. But she really wasn't sure what the unincorporated tax rate was in Pima County. I feel that somebody who's going to be taxing me should know what the tax rate is. So if somebody <laughs> could help Supervisor Miller, then I believe the Arizona general sales tax is 6.6%. .6%. And the next thing I'd like to talk about is Supervisor Miller's radio show that she likes to call Miller Time that doesn't allow call-ins. Now, if you don't allow call-ins, it appears that it's an infomercial that should be somewhere in the in-kind contributions of campaign contributions. If Supervisor Miller is paying for this, I would really like to know where the money is coming from, seeing as how she spent Pima County money to build a website, which she didn't think Pima County's website was good enough. 
And I was so glad to hear that other gentleman talk about Parkinson's. When I broke down last week, I thought it was just because I was turning into a wimp. Uh, I haven't told any of my neighbors about that. But I, I guess that's it. Just to let you know a little bit more of what's on my thoughts for the day and have a really good week. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Ed Moore? I couldn't resist this opportunity to talk to Oh, you. I know. <laughs> All right, when uh, David got up and talked about the Rito Racetrack Committee, we finally agreed that we would agree to see the racetrack torn down and soccer fields put on it, but Pima County had to build the $55 million facility that had been presented to us as the cost of the new racetrack. And that had to be built before we would agree to that. Uh, he knows that. The other thing, uh, my three sons played for Tucson United, which was the predecessor to Tucson Soccer Academy. I used to raise a lot of money for Tucson United. I remember giving Wolfgang a $7,500 check to fund the Jacobs Park Tournament. Dick Grasso retired from the New York Stock Exchange with a $30 million retirement account. The New York Stock Exchange was a non-profit corporation. I know what the Tucson Soccer Academy charges their students. You should not lease property to that organization until they make their books and records public. You will be surprised at how much money they make. Thank you. Thank you. Sophia Blue? Hello, um, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Sophia Blue. I live at 3217 East 25th in Tucson. I am the vice chair of SEIU Pima chapter and an employee of Pima County. Between 2010 and 2013, the consumer price index went up by 6.5%. And while employees gratefully received what was called a modest raise by Mr. Huckleberry, it wasn't enough to bridge the gap between wage increase and cost of living. Employees are still sadly behind, especially Pima County employees in the lowest wage jobs. Those employees have taken the worst hits, paying almost 20% more to clothe their families, 7% more in food costs, and 8% more in housing costs that they did not, that they, than they did only three years ago. The downturn in the economy continues to hurt the lowest earners the most and hurts our economy by making those most likely to spend into those who are most likely to struggle to keep their lives intact. I'm not sure if you remember our members' comments at a previous meeting letting you know that we'd asked employees for their victories and hardships at work and in life, but I'd like to share more with you today. One library employee shared that kids from low-income neighborhood near the library are now able to come to the library for after-school snacks provided through hard work by library employees and a partnership with the Community <coughs> Food Bank. We know that they are hungry after school and this partnership makes us really happy, she said. Another employee shared that she is leaning toward default on her student loans, as am I, and she is forced to pay her utilities and payments as the cost of everything has gone up while her wages haven't matched that increase. This is why a dollar raise will be so impactful. For this library employee, it'll mean the difference between not having to choose which bills to let go unpaid. For others, it will pay for their gas to get to work each week. A dollar will be a real step forward for employees who earn the least and are struggling the most. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, we hope you'll consider this uh, information I've given you um, in this coming year's budget. Um, and also that you'll remember those who not only gave, give significantly and creatively to their jobs in their community, but also our lowest earners in Pima County. It's time for a buck, Chuck. Thanks. <laughs> it's really two buck, Chuck. It's a buck, Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Chuck. <laughs> um, Mark, why? Did you want to speak again? or? Uh, no, I'm okay. Uh, I just wanted to present that. Why? Okay. 
Okay. Wait, why don't you come up? You're speaking. Come up and speak. <laughs> I just wanted to present that to the board as highest and best use for the park and uh, and also use for uh, soccer, horse racing, and special events. And there's only so much dirt there and all events, all activities require uh, parking. And you gotta have spectators and you gotta have participants. So, uh, all I need to say. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> Is there anyone else who wishes to address us and call to the audience? Just to set the record straight, Mr. Lees, I can back you in all my costs that I presented to you. And I don't appreciate being referred to as dispensing misinformation. You need to state your name officially. Kurt Muscom. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Peggy Gomez. I'm the stall superintendent at Vito Race Park. I live at 1317 West Sonora. Uh, I actually gave uh, Richard Elias here a fact finding fact around our track as to what uh, was planted and what was on the future. At one time, we had 180 to 200 horses back then. When Howard King took it over, after the Goodman tied up in courts for years and years, uh, Howard came in with his own money. I think they, just that inner track, the, the, the jockey's kill made it put all that safety reel all around it. We invested it. Uh, the horsemen invested on the backside thousands of dollars. The sheetrock, volunteer work. We roofed it. The whole thing. Like I said, it was a fact-finding tour. And after that tour, the, the barn started coming down. We had a cafeteria back there. We were self-sustained. We could uh, take care of our horsemen. When Howard agreed, okay, the horsemen agreed, we'll settle that back part and we'll start from there. Like I said, when I was there, we had 180 to 200 horses back there, little by little. I guess the fact finding fact was that, well, okay, let's start knocking down the barns. We don't need the barns. We leave this little barns. And little by little, all of that has been eliminated. Uh, the, the Pima County, Pima County Horsemen's Association, the just of three people. And that's Pat, Pat White, Shirley, and Bill Matthews. That's what the Pima County Horsemen's Association is. When Howard started it, we had 50 to 60 members. I think some of you were even members to that organization. Boyle was one of the ones that, one of the supervisors, I get my times up. But. To tell you the truth, that, that's what it is. I've been going to that track 60 years, 70 years, you know. What do we have left? We have, a, uh, as far as when I was growing up in this town, what do we have left? We have Grandaw, we have the Royal Grounds, and we have Uriido. That's all we got. And now we're going to start knocking them down? My God, this belongs to the people. I can see my, my, grandkids, adopted grandkids go there like I did and enjoy it. And you talk about Mexican and, and, and a, a relationship with Mexico, you go to those stands and I guarantee you 80% of those Mexicans are in that stand of Mexicans having a good time. So little by little it's been knocking down, knocking down, knocking down, knocking down. Let's get together and save this place for our kids, for your kids. For our history, you know, that's part of Tucson, man. We own a lot to these horses. When the when the deal was eliminated was when the state came in and took out all the funding for all these little communities. 
Safford, Duncan, sir, Douglas. Sir, your time sorry. is up. Thank you. I just want to. Name I'm Patty Shirley, and I just want to make Stephanie feel better. It's been a long time since we only paid three thousand dollars. We pay like twenty-five thousand dollars for our lease. I mean, you can check the figures and get the exact amount, but it's been a long time since we only paid three thousand. So I just want to set the record straight. Thank, Thank you, Cheryl. There are no further speakers. This meeting stands adjourned. Yeah. <laughs>